Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our regular Monday stream. Mm-hmm. We are not is. late. That is lies. No. Um, <laughs> that is lies and slander. We are, we are precisely when we mean to be here. But uh, as always, I'm joined by our host, since technically it's her Monday show. Yes, exactly. She's, she's taken over, guys. Everyone's <coughs> taken over. Send help. Um, she's taken over the stream. <laughs> But I'll let you lead because I'm still somewhat poorly. I'm probably I probably sound a lot more poorly than I am now. I do think probably, I mean maybe we won't get into it straight away. But uh, I was on Pete's show sort of last week doing stuff, and I now consider the fact that some of the people listened to that had to listen to me go, <laughs> just like mouth breathing like a cold the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, you were a little bit claggy, as we say. Yeah, a little, little bit of the old clag. But it has been snowing here quite a lot. No, I suppose it's properly winter now. Yeah, have you, uh, have you guys had snow where you are? I don't know. It's we'll do some normal weather preamble. Yes. Um, how's the weather where how, you how, guys are at? How's how's the weather at Langley? Yeah, how's the weather in Langley, guys? Oh God, how's how's the weather in whatever dire London unit people are in? Mm. Uh, well, we've got a big one today. We have a a rather large stream. Um. We'll get into relatively soon, but before that, I'll do the normal YouTube YouTube things. Uh, we are still fully monetized, so we, you can donate to us via Streamlabs, which I will put in the chat. Or if you feel like sharing the money with Google, uh, you can still super chat us. We still have memberships available. You can send all those stupid like super stickers or whatever people use these days. Uh, we you you can throw shekels on us, so there are methods to throw shekels on us, and we will be uh, making sure we read people's questions. We uh, YouTube backend's terrible at keeping track of that, but luckily we use Streamlabs, which doesn't tend to miss too much. So we uh, we will have your uh, your questions up when you do ask them. So that's that's the normal YouTube stuff. Apart from that, there's our links down below. Mm. You can join our Telegram. I have a legacy Discord, and we also write on. Our uh, substack, which is anti-politics. Sometimes. Yeah, I noticed James Murray in the chat saying, "Does the seventy-seventh brigade get winter fuel allowance?" Yes, of course they do. They burn all the books. They uh, yeah, yeah, take yeah. off of people. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the seventy-seventh people. People know. People are wise. But we've uh, oh, we've got a lot. Got quite a lot to cover here. Well, we quickly mentioned before as well, just to get the the usual run of the mill stuff out of the way. That yeah, not only was I on peak cues show last week reading yes. some Jonathan Bowden, which we might be doing again at some point. Uh, keep, keep your ears peeled. Uh, you were also on Jay Burden's show last week. I was on Jay Burden's show, yes. So if, if you guys want to check that out, I made a community post about it, but I think that disappeared. Yes. Because they make community posts expire now. So I'll probably, I'll probably put another community post out about that at some point. Uh, although I might put it as a comment to this video too, since it's yeah, the best probably. way. But we have been uh, crossing over with other people's stuff. You may have caught that, you may not, because YouTube are shit. But uh, but what we're covering today is uh, it's New Britain, guys. Yeah, it's, it's Br- New Britain. It's like the old Britain, but it's new. New Britain. New Britain. Did you enjoy the war in Afghanistan? I, I sure did. Did you like the war in Iraq? Even better than the last one. Well, you'll love New Britain. New Britain, from the people who brought you the call to prayer in Lancashire. It's New Britain. New Britain, guys. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, do you like old Britain? Well, you can't have old Britain because that's racist. You're getting New Britain. <laughs> what is... What do you think, Barry Scott? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you, I think you, Britain. So thank you, Barry Scott. It's new Britain. That's, uh, that's enough of that skit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, where? Uh, oh my God! What we're going over today is. Uh, is... See, you have to you have to offer the consumers the most important thing about New Britain. What is that? Uh, that it's. Bonkers new Britain. Bonkers new Stormzy Britain. Bonkers Stormzy Blighty Britain, boys. That's, that's, that's the second advert. Yeah. That's when people who know what new Britain is. Bonkers Stormzy Korean chips Britain. <laughs> Coronation chicken. Do you like EastEnders? <laughs> From the people uh, that sanctioned female genitalization. <laughs> From the producers of Rape Gangs. Brings New Britain. 
Oh dear, yeah, we've we've got a new a new bonkers a new bonkers Britain thing going on here. Um, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you guys like New Britain. I'm gonna leave Barry Scott up for a little bit because he's uh, he's a British icon, <laughs> and all the Americans are incredibly confused because they don't know about well, but Barry Scott is our. Uh, oh, Who's the American guy that does? He's in like the South Park bit. Uh, I'm not sure. He does like the sla- not not a slap chop guy. The guy before the slap chop <laughs> slap guy. Slap chop guy. Um, someone like, Billy Mays. Billy, Billy Mays. Mays here. Yeah, yeah. Barry Scott is our Billy Mays. Barry Scott. Oh, is... sorry, no. Billy Mays is your Barry Scott. Oh man, I might just clip that. I might just make a new Britain kind of little video for the channel. <laughs> But that was that was uh, my little idea there. But good lord, we have a lot to cover. So the people that brought you the paedophile information exchange. <laughs> uh, that was Liberty. Um, I, I Keir Starmer was CPS when the uh, <laughs> Jimmy Zavo charges I'm, I'm, came through. Mate. I'm leaving that there. We that should was... we should put that like top right or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's covering up this weird juggied fella here. Look at him. Look at the state of him. I'm leaving the New Britain side. <laughs> yeah, a couple of pints in that man. <laughs> I'm leaving him right there. It looks like a Weatherspoons picture. <laughs> he's you're, he's staying right you're on. You're barred, mate. Right on your mug. Right on your mug. There we go. But this has been rather banally reported by the media as uh, as Labour promised biggest ever transfer of powers, which is right because it's a transfer of power to them. <laughs> yes. And we mean that in the royal the royal them. <laughs> yeah. The, I don't know, we might have a bit of a weird approach to this and it will take, I think, a minute or two for some people to work out where we're going. Yeah. But we're going to try and explain what their new... It's not necessarily a manifesto because it's no. not around election time, but it also has a lot bigger ramifications in it than a manifesto. It's like almost a treatise for a new federal structure of British governance. Well, it's extremely... Apparently, this is par for the course for Gordon Brown. Because Gordon Brown used oh, to do yes, this of course. We all have... the time. It's full... Yeah, this this is a massive policy document written by Gordon Brown. But it, it's some of you who have interfaced... Move over, major rights. Yeah. There's a new bloke in town. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Blairites have been defeated. It is full spectrum Brownite dominance. He's coming for the rest of your pension. <laughs> it's, I've got uh, the rest of your pension. It's it's the revenge of like nineties and early two thousands. He's gonna sell politics. whatever gold's left. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I call it the gold standard, but he sold all the gold. <laughs> uh, but this uh. is this is being reported in the media as mostly to do with devolution, which it is kind of. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you take them at their word. Uh, Labour leader Keir Starmer has promised the biggest ever transfer of power from Westminster to the British people. I, this great is this stuff is great because it's extremely democratization. Well, as uh, yeah, it's like we we have already got universal suffrage to like yeah. criminals and immigrants and sixteen year olds. How what people are not empowered. Well, you know, it's the the electoral system doesn't work. We're going to have to bring democracy again. What is this like? Democracy's seventeenth coming in the real UK? democracy has never been tried. Real democracy has never been. Tried. Um, they talk. The main headline here and the main discussion point is the abolition of the House of Lords, which has been quite a long time coming. If you follow British politics to any degree, um, it, it the House of Lords was as we'll go into. In later in the stream is because it's mentioned in the text actually it was effectively rendered moot by the 1911 Parliament Act hmm. um, after the, in the week of the the People's Budget. Again, this all links in very heavily with our democratization what? stuff. <clears throat> stuff so. Any way in which the Lords could have executed any sort of decisionist sovereign power over yeah. Parliament itself was essentially made impossible, and so too was its requirement for some form of hereditary status yeah. to become part of it as an institution which is i mean that's the kind of thing is like people outside of the uk they look at the monarchy as this sort of last vestige of tradition but really it's it's something more like the lords which not to get into a really long-winded conversation about monarchy versus aristocracy you could probably argue that britain has had one of the longest traditions of a, an aristocratic governance and that isn't to say that the parliamentarians didn't have some issues, but that 
at least it persisted for quite a long time compared to somewhere like, you know, you look how quickly the French republics fell back yeah. to something like abs- fell back on absolutist monarchy whilst not calling it monarchy. <coughs> so it's kind of it's interesting to sort of think about it more through that dynamic and we will try at some point throughout this stream to indicate what sort of structure of government we currently have and we'll yes. be moving to. This this is going to have to have diagrams. This The report entitled A New Britain put forward 40 recommendations and that's not 40 bullet points. No. That's 40 like different sections. It's an 150 page <clears throat> document. It is insane. Uh, and it's deliberately, I think, obfuscating what it's meaning to do. The big headline stuff, like I said, is is, is Lords reform. It's to do with the, re- the removal of the House of Lords and its replacement with a new second chamber, as they call it. Mm. There's a lot of interchangeable language here. There'll be talk of councils, assemblies, and chambers, all semi-interchangeably and all relatively confusingly. Um Again, this is that this document is a mess. I've seen a couple of people go over it in something of a surface level, mm. but this, like, I we had to sit here and pick this apart quite heavily. I've had to actually draw like diagrams. Oh, there was there was definitely yesterday like a good hour and a half, two yeah. hours of like just brain scratching because well, as we will try for the sake of exercising like sort of intellectual rigor to go with it as they say yeah. it should work. And you can kind of map it out, but it's there is so much sort of feedback and obfuscation and points where they say things that are essentially contradictory that you'd be like, well, is this really how it's supposed to be? Or are they, you know, much as they seem to do previously, and as we will get into as well, and that what this document serves to do is answer a subset of questions that were never fully answered during the reforms of British government in the 2000s. Yes. And in doing so, leave out another whole set of questions which can be answered in future. Yeah, James Mary's correct. The document itself is an extreme slog to read. We had to keyword search it to find the relevant stuff. There's also things that interplay with each other very closely that are deliberately separated yes. by hundreds of pages in the document. So you don't put two and two together without really, really ferreting through it. Uh, it's like reading the Old Testament and New Testament together. Yeah, it is. Or oh, it, there's your prophet archetype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's very, very... A lot of it is like pure power stuff as well. But just showing here, these are the points they talk about in the BBC are the very surface level things. Give local authorities new fiscal powers, blah, blah, blah. Regional clusters. It's all very localism, devolution, devolution, localism. But the meat of it really, and there was, again... A massive kind of like live tweeting, essentially, that the BBC does in their live vertical here about what this is. And they don't cover any of it, really, because they're like, oh, Scotland, Scotland, constitutional question. This is all about Scotland. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the way this is being framed as well is, is about saving the union. What's happened is anyone who who's followed British politics knows that the devolved chambers or you know they, they don't call them parliaments the assemblies the welsh assembly the scottish assembly the northern irish assembly were created whole cloth by labor in the in the late 90s and early 2000s and they have created this problem where they have these deliberately separatist uh parliaments that will obviously become Almost like fake secondary power. Yeah, centers. no, it's like I can see Ben Gale in chats. So they want the Lords to become House of Commons 2.0. Well, we'll no, no, <laughs> it's a whole lot worse oh, than we'll, that. We'll get into that. There's there's a lot to cover here, and I'm I'm a little bit worried because I I can't. Like, it's so stuff you can't all keep in your head at once. It's so no. complex and interlinked. We'll go we'll go one piece at a time here. Yeah, but this this is the document. Um, oh, where's it gone? This is the document you'll be staring at for a while. And we'll we'll go over it. Um, it also goes over. Sorry, it also coincidentally shares a name with uh, Tony Blair's book from the nineties, from nineteen ninety seven, before he was elected, called New Britain: My Vision for a Young Country. Um, we've I managed to ferret out a copy from uh, from the Internet Archive, so we'll probably go over a little bit of that near the end. But it's not actually that relevant. It's more like an extended manifesto from the 1990s mm. so it's not actually that interesting unfortunately um but it does it's funny that it does share a name with new with uh tony blair's book 
So it's very, very clear that this is a new labour project. But it, you... it will also make sense as well when we start to point to, and that's what I meant, you know, the, the questions brought up and the reforms Tony Blair brought through British government yeah. and the early to mid and then the late 2000s and Gordon Brown's government. Yeah. You know, the, the Supreme Court, all these different committees and these bodies and these new institutions, where are they meant to sit? What is their role supposed to be? Yes. You know, what is actually the the extent to which their powers extend over? Because we, as we have found with the Supreme Court in the UK, yeah, it was really only supposed to judge a very small number of things internally within the House of Commons and actually became an entity which could be abused to essentially totally strike out law, like things like Brexit. Yes, it's it's attempted to be used that way. It hasn't, yeah, or it has at least been. Yeah, it hasn't quite done that yet, but it does have the capacity, and it does essentially neuter the traditions of the High Court. The Supreme Court is something very akin to the institutions they want to create using this program. But the document is entitled rather loftily, "New Britain: Renewing Our Democracy and Rebuilding Our Economy." Report of the Commission on the UK's future. Imagine that. It's again very lofty. So it's, but... it's from the Soothsayers Commission. Yes. And again, this is this is a Brownite document. It, this is written by Gordon Brown himself, which is I don't know. I I I, I read a bit of this before I realised that, but it's uh, it's kind of amazing that Gordon Brown is the man who's been able to. Uh, before we go through any of the body of the text, actually, it's very, very telling about what isn't yes. mentioned in this document. Despite sharing a name with Tony Blair's book, and despite being called New Britain, the term New Labour is not used anywhere in this document. Mm. It doesn't reference New Labour's programmes, it doesn't reference the fact that it's meant to finish many of New Labour's programmes, it doesn't reference New Labour at all. I don't think it even mentions fact, I've not done this yet. Um, what do you think? Do you think it mentions Blair? Uh, oh, no, I tried looking up Blair. That was the first thing I looked up, and there were zero mentions of zero, him. Zero mentions of Tony Blair. So this is a document named after Tony Blair's book that doesn't mention New Labour and doesn't mention Tony Blair. It's quite amazing. Uh, there's only two mentions of the word stakeholder, which has been a big buzzword recently and was yeah. a big and is something that's talked about quite heavily in Tony Blair's book called New Britain. But and I, you you seem to be mentioning us here is that the stakeholder capitalism is a sort of done deal. Yes. That's assumed and that that sort of linguistic seed has been very thoroughly sown. Well, the other thing I want to lock up is immigration. immigration yeah. Which isn't, it's the word is in the document, as you will see here. But the word is only in the document when it comes to this rank, this dubious ranking list of um, the the UK's priorities. This is the priorities in England, Scotland, and Wales, and lower immigration is mentioned as a priority in both England and Wales. I, it's a lot lower than it should be. A lot of them show it's number two, uh, mm. depending on what time of year it is, or number four at the lowest. But this is their kind of ranking. They're saying, ooh, the NHS, ooh, higher wages, lower levels of poverty and homelessness, more affordable housing. They're basically self-congratulating, going, well, we, we know what Britain believes. But that is the only mention of the term immigration is buried in a ranking that they don't address. There is no addressing of immigration in this document whatsoever, which is weird, again, uh, because of all the chest beating we talked about a couple of weeks ago about immigration that Keir Starmer has been doing. It does not appear in this document. Um, there's no direct mention of the role of judiciary in this either, mm. which, is, which would be a huge thing. Uh, the abolition of the House of Lords is one of the first proposals made in this document, and it is one of the most sweeping changes that is put forward here. You know, they refer to it as the undemocratic House of Lords. But there's no talk about how the judiciary will interface with the rest of these mechanisms. And I, I don't think that they would completely shut out the judiciary because the judiciary does sit in the Lords. Judges do sit in the Lords. It is one of their well, important functions. Especially when you consider the fact that the other unmentioned player, one of his great sort of additions that is given to is about... Uh, 
you know, his reforms of the British government was the Supreme Court. This this new judiciary element meant to, in a certain sense, ape, you know, the, the American style, the three structures of government and this, yep. that and the next thing. Yes, uh, James Murray mentioned something I was about to mention, which is police, which only is mentioned in passing about policing hubs and asbos. Um, we have a £10 donation here from Kate's. Uh, thank you, Kate. She says, looking forward to your take on the House of Lords. I'm conflicted. I don't like it in its current form, but as a group, they've uh, they've stopped a lot of bad policy recently, as they can be pressured, uh, uh, as they can't be pressured with the selection question mark. Kind of yes. The House of Lords is again. It can only really make recommendations. It is a powerless chamber because of the invocation of parliamentary pl- privilege. That's seen as bad practice in quotes. But like I said, it's been a hundred years of a deliberately broken system. And now they're talking about reshaping it in a way that would benefit them the most. Uh, there's a few more things that I wanted to talk about, which this entire document is predicated on. This document is also predicated on the fact that Labour think they have already won the next election. Yes. And they already think that they have won the next election to such a degree that they are able to create what are essentially constitutional changes in Britain which means that they think that they have enough political capital not to really talk about at this point the actual frontline issues that the papers talk about, like, you know, the cost of living crisis, immigration, all of these different things are pushed far, far into the background in this new Britain document. It is extremely dense discussion of what will be the British constitution and what will be the remade British constitution. There are things in this document that fall short of saying explicitly, but imply that there will be the equivalent of a written English or British Mm. um, constitution. Well, it's, I mean, it's that in and of itself is, that's hours worth of conversation in there. And for anyone that would want anything on that, please do go read uh, Imperium Press's Collected Works of De Maestra. Because some of his elucidations on the idea of going from a an unwritten to a written constitution is is a revolutionary step. You're taking something that was a, a learned, felt, and always had to be communicated element of tradition, and you're trying to formalize it and stamp it into something, and not just formalize it, but formalize an interpretation of it. Which in a certain sense, not to like sit here and talk about the great elements of what was English liberalism, this, that, and the next thing. But the yeah. fact that the, you could go in a court, hark right back to something like the Magna Carta and attempt to give your own <coughs> sort of interpretation, or at least justify something by an interpretation of it, I think was one of the things that made Britain Britain, really. And now that yes. what they're trying to do is, not that people do that anymore nowadays, but to, to fully come to the point of going, <laughs> no, that's not how we do it anymore. It's quite, uh, it's quite telling that they're willing to do such a thing. Well, it is, it is a form, a formalization. Uh, no, no spoilers there, James Murray. No spoilers. Yeah. This um, is all. Uh, we can all blame this on Sargon, of course, because <laughs> it was his idea to write a British constitution. Well, yeah. What, what if, what if he wrote a constitution? Yeah, uh, Labour's about to write it. How do you, how do you feel about that one? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But what is in the document is telling. Um, the word constitution is mentioned, or variations thereof, are mentioned 164 times. So if I quickly just, again, I can show you. Constitu- 183 times, okay. Um, no, 160, 164 yeah. times, sorry, because that's constant. Thing. Constitution men- is mentioned 124 times. Uh, devolution or devolved is mentioned. 250 times. So the, the variations on the word devolved or devolution appear 250 times. That's getting towards twice a page. That's like one and a half times every single page the word devolution is mentioned. Um, and it's mostly this devolution that gets the thrust of the attention. And again, this is a huge, huge document. I'll just quickly take you up to some of the contents of it. So, state of Britain today, crisis, getting to the root of the problems, Britain's unbalanced. These are very general titles and don't yeah. actually well, tell you what's uh, in there. On the terms of economy, though, yeah. one of the things that you also don't mention 
is UBI. No. But in a roundabout way, as we'll get to later, they are essentially writing in clauses for things like that. Yes. Or writing in pieces of legislation or requirements. Like when we get later on to their, their notions of transparency and anti-corruption, the, the standards by which they would use to judge whether or not an institution or an element of government was corrupt, they would need more data on how these either members or aspects of government function from the first point to even get into judging them in that sense. Yes. So it's, it's instantly writing in a requirement for, oh, well, we need, we need to be able to snoop on more people and you know, delve out more information. Um, there is a lot here about devolution, but I think a lot of that is, just, well, in terms of the devolution structure we have now in terms of the government's or effective governments of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. A lot has been made of the fact that um, Scotland has been promised enhanced status internationally in devolved areas. The Foreign Affairs Reservation should be amended to permit the Scottish Government, with the agreement of the Scottish Parliament, to enter into international agreements and join international bodies in relation to devolved matters. So that's kind of a wink and a nod towards the fact that Scotland will possibly be allowed in some ways to be close to the EU. It can associate with certain bodies. It would be a struggle because, as we all know about the whole Catalonia question and breakaway regions in the rest of Europe, Europe doesn't actually like that. And the members of the, of the European Parliament don't actually really want that. But yes, that, that is the EU. That is one of the headline things that people have talked about endlessly. But, but honestly, I think that's almost a distraction. Yes. The enhanced powers for devolved governments is the big bone that is being thrown to the Scottish electorate to try and make them think that this whole project is about them. When, as, as we'll see, this entire process is actually about bringing Scotland to heel. It will integrate the devolved governments, into the overarching government of the UK, and it will paralyse it in terms of, of meaningful difference of policy. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the sort of theme that will become evident here, is that they are sort of putting out strings so that each little different fiefdom, each mayor, each sort of council or assembly or devolved assembly has its own little bit of power. But the moment at which they step out of, which we can only presume a strict set of standards, yes. they will be hung out to dry. So really they are only, as per usual, being empowered under the clause that they comply. Well, there's a lot of stuff here as well about empowering mayors and the creation of directly elected mayors in Scotland. They talk about mayors, 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 local, 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 local. There's a lot of pretending here uh, that there will be devolution of power, when really what they're doing is they're bringing in the last kind of vestiges of local policy, which is local councils and local men, and they are reintegrating them in an overarching power structure, um, the top of which will be their kind of super replacement for the House of Lords, which, I don't know, we should, we should probably talk about that as the first point of detail, because the replacement of the House of Lords... Um, I, so our take might surprise you in that I'm really not that bothered about the fate of the Lords. The Lords has not been an effective body for an exceptionally long time. And it's, it's been very, very obvious this was going to happen at some point yeah. since 1911. I don't hold, you know, that it's sad, as you talked about, but that the Lords is this continuous point from kind of Britain's history right up into its present but I, I can't really weep for the Lords as some people are doing because of how ineffectual it's been. Well, yeah, I, I, just before we yeah. stop there, uh, we've got super chat there from Kate. I we already read that one. Oh, did you? Oh, fair enough. I was going to say, the fact that, you know, there won't really be a take in the House of Lords because there's not really much to say. The House of Lords doesn't reel. Yeah. And House of Lords doesn't, it doesn't been real since It just exists to pay people who used to be MPs nowadays. Yeah, it's the retirement chamber for, for MPs. It's not something that has actual bearing on our everyday lives. And I know people like to think it does, but that is that is largely illusory. Um, they're talking about this devolved structure forming into... What, no, uh, the, 
I'll have you know, the House of Lords is not geographically representative. Yeah. <laughs> Again, all of the language in this is about devolution than integration. Yeah. It's to do with smashing Britain into tiny little pieces and then reassembling those pieces through various layers of bureaucracy and power structure. Well, yeah, because this is where they start talking about this new nebulous second chamber. Yeah. Which is an entity we believe to be the Assembly of Nations and Regions. But what they're re- uh, proposing, replacing the House of Lords with, is something called the Assembly of Nations and Regions, which is very important <laughs> in terms of how it functions, because it will be more powerful than the Lords. Uh, they go over the fact that it will be uh, subject to the same standards as the Ministerial Code of Conduct. So it's essentially a second parliament. Um, but here's what they're pitching for this uh, very, very boring named uh, Assembly of Nations. and Not to be confused with what we'll talk about later, which is the Council of Nations and Regions. One um, of these things is not, not like, like the, the other. other. <laughs> it, again, deliberately convoluted, but... The critical role of the new chamber, however, relates to the upholding of the British Constitution. This will include protecting the constitutional distribution of power between Parliament at Westminster and the three devolved legislatures, where the Convention, even though recognised in statute, has failed to offer sufficient protection. So it becomes a self-folding scheme. This, First of all, this means that this cannot be undone easily by a subsequent government, yeah. because this new chamber will have the power to defeat Parliament when it comes to matters about the new chamber. Well, because the beauty of the trick is <clears throat> Labour can impose this yeah. on the grounds of one election win, assuming the election win is legitimate, fair, yeah. not fortified, and then can proceed to suggest that any government that is elected on a, you know, a manifesto for getting rid of this structure which they're imposing are doing something undemocratic well, because they're getting rid of an institution that, and set of structures that were implemented they're not only democratically, doing some, don't you yeah, know? They're not only doing something <clears throat> undemocratic, they're doing something unconstitutional. Oh yes, <clears throat> that's the deeper level to that as well. As we will see. Um, the mechanism which we recommend is based on the existing seldom acknowledged protection built into the Parliament Act of 1911. The Act removed the House of Lords' power to reject legislation and replaced <laughs> it by a power to delay but was subject to one exception. <clears throat> the House of Lords can still reject a bill uh, to extend the term of Parliament. So basically the laws is that it stop Parliament voting itself back in continuously. Mm. That's its only real function. Paradoxically enough, therefore, the unelected House of Lords acts as safeguard for democracy in the, in the United States. We recommend that the new chamber retains this power. Here's the important part. And that the power should be extended in one area only. Legislation relating to certain other constitutional statutes, which we refer to to here as protected constitutional statutes. This is only possible with a written British constitution yes. or equivalent of. What they are calling for here is a written it's like a, constitution. It's, it's actually more like a standards and practices sort <clears throat> of yeah. remit that these are, yeah, or, or as we'll get to, these are going to be a subset of standards which an independent intergovernmental body of the intergovernmental interdependent secretariat yeah. will d- discern whether or not you have independently and intergovernmentally met the standards of the secretariat. <laughs> the second chamber, so the replacement of the House of Lords, would have an explicit power to reject legislation which related to a narrow list of defined constitutional statutes. The effect of this would be a form of what's called entrenchment. That is to say, making a particular statutory provision more difficult to amend than ordinary law. Given this power to the Second Chamber of Parliament, sustains the principle at the core of much of the UK Constitution of parliamentary supremacy. Again, that contradicts it completely. Mm. Just like, Parliament is no longer supreme in cases of constitutional law. But it was never supposed to be supreme. No. So how how would that be a problem they have to deal with unless, of course, they're aware of the fact that <clears throat> Parliament and its several committees around it, if structured in the right way, can actually be used in a sort of supreme and sovereign fashion. They they are used in a sovereign fashion. In fact, there's there's no mention here in any of this of the interface with the Crown. Mm. Because Parliament and all of its subservient apparatus 
serves at the pleasure of his, well, his majesty the king now. Mm. That is how the, the British system still functions. It's a constitutional monarchy. It's not theory. even a fig leaf anymore. No, it's, it's not even a fig leaf. They don't even notice the fig leaf's there. So there's, there's no mention here of how royal ascents and royal supremacy, really, will interact with this new, this new chamber. Because in their mind, it won't. No. And it's really an acknowledgement that the, the monarchy has no constitutional role. It is not a constitutional monarchy. It is a joke. Or the pedophiles. Um, <laughs> for all of it's necessary to be clear about the limited range of proposed legislation to apply to, it will be in many cases perfectly plain whether the bill being considered makes a material amendment to a protected statute. Most will not. So what they're saying here is that almost all measures from the House of Commons will potentially be subject to veto by this new second chamber, by the Assembly of Nations and Regions. And that will be decided by a body that we'll, we will talk about later, which has been dubbed in extremely managerial terms, the Intergovernmental Independent Secretariat. Yes, because it's independent and yes. intergovernmental, don't you know? So it's an unelected body, but we'll get to that later. So, oh, is that what independent means then? Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, safeguarding... First, we'll be required to refer to the question... Question for court, most likely directed to Supreme. Here we go. Um, we propose that the second chamber, through its providing officer, if it contemplates using its safeguarding power, first be required to refer the question to the court, most likely directly to the Supreme Court. Which so is an already captured institution. Yes. For an authoritative judgment on whether the constitutional protection powers are engaged, the question will be whether the legislation related to one of the constitutional statutes were related to means more than simply has a passing reference or connection to and something closer to is mainly about nice but legalese there. Yes, there is. But to, to cut through the jargon, to cut through the legalese, to cut through the bullshit, really, all Labour has to do to make this new second chamber, this assembly of regions and nations, more powerful than Parliament is to make the British constitution as wide-ranging as possible. Mm. And the next part of this, we will see how exactly they're thinking doing this. Um, we'll go into some more of the structural stuff later. I want to rearrange how we're doing this slightly. Um, but the, there is something in this document, really, where they, they talk about new kind of powers. They talk about new constitutional... I can figure out what that is, sorry. The... Uh, it's 72 here. here. Here's the section. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it, it's the section on rights, individual rights, social rights, and, and essentially just all of the things we now, we used to deal with, or like when we were all still doing the libertarian thing and we, we spent the time trying to explain to people like there are these things called positive rights. Yeah. And they require other people's action to affirm so things like health care and other sort of things attached to that can't really be rights proper because in doing so you're writing an obligation to someone else under the constitution. Bit of a longer conversation, but I, yeah, I, I it's think, a guarantee of basically all those things. Uh, John, real name in the chat. Uh, John, not real name, uh, is is asking constitutional questions. As you will know from some of our writings and what we said here, we don't believe in the efficacy. And the power to protect of constitutions. Yeah. Constitutions are meaningless. Well, as, uh, as you used the line I used to use on yeah. Twitter and Jay Burden's show, the American Constitution would only serve protecting people if it was printed on several inch thick screens of Lexan. Yes. Um, having or not having a constitution functionally, in reality, does nothing. Yeah. Constitutional reform, as important as it may sound, as important as it may be in terms of legal functionary internally, to the average person, doesn't matter because what matters is who, is realities of power and who is in power. Yes. But recommendation four and five are the massive ones. Remember what you just heard? You just heard that the new Assembly of Regions and Nations would have the power to veto Parliament as overseen by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court can say it has power in any case, basically, if it's a corner case, um, over anything that is relevant 
constitutionally relevant. I, I do like the fact that they haven't mentioned immigration, but yeah, just in that the latter half of that first sentence there or first paragraph. But the rights which people enjoy to key social provisions, most notably free healthcare and education, are also very highly valued and may more often be more to the front of people's minds when they think of being a citizen of the UK. Yes. Um, Consistent with the purpose of the UK, we recommend extending rights from the civil and political into the social sphere with the sort of protection we recommend for key constitutional provisions later in the report. That's explicit. Mm. With the sort of protection we recommend for key constitutional provisions in this report. So, the Assembly of Regions and Nations will have primacy over any of these areas mentioned here as essentially new human rights. The potential range of social rights is very wide and extending into such areas as economy and culture. Recognizing such rights and campaigning legally and in other ways to deliver them in practice is a project supported by many in progressive politics. That's such a, such a power statement there. A key aim for us, however, is to safeguard rights which we perceive as being under threat. So the new social rights really will be health yes. so there uh, have we got the bit here where they talk about or is this when we get that's later in dispute yeah the, the minimum standards yeah thing, yeah, which yeah. Is connected not, to this. that's later in this bit but um we therefore propose that the rights created and protected should be those that form the foundation of the uk welfare state and over which there is broad consensus among the oh, uk population is there now? yeah <laughs> They're basically saying that the politics is settled, and we'll see that multiple times in here. The people like their gibbs. There's some pure power stuff we'll get to later on that will make your jaw drop even further. So that our recommendations taken together address William Beveridge's 5e blah 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 socialist stuff, the form of the rights. Rights can be a concrete form or more aspirational. They basically say, to sum up this paragraph, it's going to be concrete. These are Mm. going to be explicit rights not just woolly, aspirational statements. We therefore propose the following basic rights package, which is subject to constitutional protection. So remember, anything that touches these areas in law, and especially in legislation, will be explicitly the remit of this new second chamber. Not to, not to interrupt you there, I like the fact that not only are people being educated by us just now, yeah. but within the chat... Uh, I see Ren is giving Thug Life Bear an introduction to Robert Filmer's Patriarcha. Yes. And the uh, the line I can see from here is, divine right of kings, as opposed to democratic right of bankers. Entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Health. Every person entitled to healthcare in the UK will receive it free at the point of need, whether they are any part of... Whether they in error in any part of the UK, no person shall be denied emergency treatment. Education. Every child shall be entitled to free primary and secondary education, whether they are part of, of the U- or any part of the UK. Poverty. This is, the, this is a big one. So no child, family or elderly citizen need live in poverty. Every person legitimately present in the UK shall be entitled... That's an interesting turn of phrase. Yeah. Legitimately present. They'll be entitled to social assistance in relation to periods of unemployment, disability, or old age in accordance with the relevant laws. No person shall be left destitute. So you're constitutionally not allowed to be... No man left behind. So, uh, like, I, what, what if you don't want to use money? Like, constitutionally, they ha- they, you have to use money. What by if this? you don't want yeah. the NHS to touch you? What if you, yeah, what if you don't want to take part in, in this system? What if I just don't want the jab? Yeah. Housing. Every person shall be entitled to decent accommodation in accordance with the realm of law relating to housing and homelessness. So any policy area voted on by the House of Commons that touches health, education, poverty or housing will be constitutionally protected and therefore subject to the oversight of the Assembly of Regions and Nations, Mm. which means that, in effect, it has primacy over all. All legislation. Yeah, I mean it's it, it doesn't. It's almost the point doesn't bear making, but that there is so much arbitrariness <clears throat> to all of this that there is almost infinite scope for things to just be shot down, pushed through, yeah, or twisted, or you know have bills completely stripped out so their contents can be filled with something completely misleading compared to the title because oh well it's related to this. This idea, don't you know? Yeah. And I see someone in chat saying this is fantasy, surely. 
Well, not really, because in a certain sense, this is kind of already how it works. Yes, this is not fantasy. They can do this, and Mm. they will do this. A lot of what was in Tony Blair's book, New Britain in 1997, seemed like fantasy. Mm. But they put most of it into reality, if you read it. Yeah, and as we will go on to show people next week, part of this sort of one-way, asymmetric, devolutionary structure is already in effect. And it's already pushing certain agendas, which you would expect it to. Yes. Uh, Again, here's two of the most important parts of this entire document. Hmm. Defining social rights. Good arguments can be made for extending social rights further to include, say, rights in relation to health or to post-school education or to guarantees about housing provision. Similarly, rights can be extended into the economic sphere on fair conditions of work or on culture and the environment. It is for the next Labour government to consider whether it wishes to pursue those options in future. So anything at any time can become a constitutionally protected right which Parliament no longer has primacy over. The rights proposed in the Commission, however, are the first significant attempt to give strict legal form as rights to well-established provisions taken for granted in the UK. That's true. These are not yet rights in the UK. They are. We have a benefit system, but we don't have rights default to it and embed them in our constitution what this also confirms is that one of the ways in which they have already been doing this is through the equalities and human rights commission that was set up in 2011 yes and that they've been using that through the avenue of the equality act set up in 2003 to push through all the civil rights crap trans rights gay rights this that and the next thing to all come from those two or that act of legislation and that committee, so they are now looking to formalise it as part of the constitution. This, again, I think this is the most important part of this document. (coughs) Rights and devolution. Mm. Constitutionally protected rights affect devolution. At the moment, the devolved legislatures in the UK cannot make laws which breach the Human Rights Act, and their governments cannot act contrary to it. The new rights we propose should be similar, as they express values and principles which are widely held across the UK and would not, in practice, prevent the devolved legislatures from making any changes which their electorates supported. That is the most amazing political sentence, because what it says is, these are settled conversations. Yes. If your devolved area doesn't agree with a massively extended welfare state, it is wrong. It is contravening its own opinion, because these are widely held beliefs. And no devolved part of the assemblies, any part of devolved government, can act contrary to these new constitutionally protected provisions. But the, if you're thinking, we'll just take over our local council, we'll just take over our lo- local devolved assembly, and we'll get rid of all, you can't. Well, it's funny <laughs> as well, because I don't know if it's something, a bit of text that we will come back to in some of the other notes you've got, but like one of the points they put is, it's a, it's a clever sort of thing to state, but it's, yeah. it's very it becomes sort of uh, asinine once you want to read the next paragraph. But they say that oh, the, the Tory party has been using benefits as a form of political patronage to yeah. build a base. So by making the new neutral standpoint, this second paragraph that we're about to get into, they are somehow taking away the political patronage aspect of giving out benefits and universal credit, and now it's just a part of the political process. So the, the, these rights will be a constraint on public bodies across England. A Labour government, as Government of England, may additionally wish to set further minimum standards for every citizen, no matter where they live, public services, or a minimum infrastructure guarantee on transport and communications networks and local amenities. No, you will not live alone in the woods, we will build a road to your shed. Yes. We will plumb the water in. And if you are not educating your children to the minimum infrastructure guarantee standard, they will be taken away from you. But it's also kind of a nod towards UBI. Yes, like this not is, entirely. This is talking around UBI. This is talking around... Guarant- this is basically talking around the Britpod. Well, yeah, these might well change over time and would not have the same constitutional status as rights but might also act as a practical guide to the scope of devolution in England, which I think here is a nod, your secretariat, yeah. to these higher bodies that hold people to your know, anti-corruption standards, uh, part of this new ethics body they're going to come up with. 
Yes. So that in theory, if you are some Northern English council, you don't want people learning about trannies in schools, and you get rid of that as part of the curriculum, you're then breaking some part of the ethics solidarity clause that they ask you to be a part of to be one of these devolved powers, and you have all your benefits taken away from you, and the muzzies in the community burn everything to the ground. And right. you just get someone else in to do the job. We're going to have to talk about some very complicated stuff now. Um, and we're not trying to show off by saying it's, it's deliberately convoluted, but we're going to have to go. Um, Kate and Chat said this is fantasy. This is fantasy, but it's already real. <laughs> it's, it's, it's already real in the sense that they they are already proposing it very seriously, and there is already steps towards making it real. There is also a structure laid out here, a very confusing structure, but a structure nonetheless, in which there are different interlocking pieces which make all of these new devolved institutions. Completely paralyzed and captured. Yes. But in order for us to go through that, we need to go through. There he is, full brown. We fo- have infographics. We do, we do. It's not complete, but here's here's how British democracy looked in 1997. You voted for local councils and local elections. There was no mayor of London. The mayor, mayor office of the mayor of London was created in the year 2000. Um, there were no directly elected mayors because that was the first directly elected mayor. Oh, well, obviously Andy Burnham hadn't smeared the BNP enough to become mayor of Manchester, (laughs) which maybe we'll get into in a stream one day. Uh, This this is the current structure of of, uh, British democracy, in quotes, in 1997. You vote for your MP. You vote for your local councillor. Your MP sits in Parliament. Parliament appoints lords. Uh... And then the lords have a small amount of oversight in terms of legislation. But it's very much a one-way street. Yeah, very much a one-way street. And this is how voting and democracy in Britain worked in 1997. This is how it looks in 2022. It's a bit of a mess, but you have your mayors over there on their own. You have your local councils. You have UK Parliament that you vote for, which the lords is in the same position. You have the, the tumour on the side of it, which is the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish Assemblies. And there's a there, there are dispute. Um, well, you've got your like your your Sewell Convention, yeah. which is the if Westminster votes in a UK wide law, the Scottish Assembly or Holyrood can turn around and say to them, "Well, under the Sewell Commission, we have a two thirds majority in the Scottish Parliament itself that says this law doesn't work for us. Yes. So you're either going to not do it here, or you have to amend it so it does work for us." This. Is what the system will look like with these proposed reforms. And this isn't even all of it. This, isn't, <laughs> this, isn't even, this is what the system will look like in terms of democratically elected bodies and then the bodies that are derived from them. This is what this is attempting to create in terms of the structure of British democracy. And it is as ludicrous as it looks. But we're going to go over some parts of it and then I'll come back to this. Because... The first part I want to go over, really, we've been over slightly some of the Assembly of Nations and Regions stuff. We kind of know what that is. That is a replacement for the House of Lords that has primacy. But one of its other functions will be in dispute resolution. So let's let's have a quick look. Let's go back here and have a look how the Assembly of Regions and Nations, as well as having primacy over what is the new British constitution, will will work in terms of disputes. Um, why is it gone? No, is it disagreement? Disputes, I believe. There we go. Um, I mean, do some resolution. Or resol- uh, you might find it's... Uh, resolving resolving disputes. disputes. There we go. There we go. There's a section here that talks about... Yeah, it's just that top paragraph there, really. Yeah. Governments will not always agree. They have different interests, different sources of information, and different political priorities. Disagreements have to be discussed and ultimately resolved. The, pro- uh, the procedures for resolving disputes between the devolved and UK governments have, however, not worked well. Our recommendation will, however, change the context for dispute resolution. First, entrenchment of powers means no, it will be no longer possible for the UK government, relying on its common priority, simply to overrule the Sewell Convention as happened in relation to the UK internal market legislation. Uh, Second, the the Solidarity Clause will create a different legal expectation on ministers and officials. 
So what is the solidarity clause? Well, <laughs> it's not explained in great detail. In It's kind of scattered around, but one of the... Uh, point number 28 is there should be a solidarity clause, a legal obligation of cooperation between the different levels of government and institutions across the UK. This means that Holyrood and all of the devolved assemblies will be legally obliged to play ball, to cooperate with the overarching UK government. The solidarity clause will effectively, uh, along with the constitutional primacy of settled policy in all of these new rights, the right to healthcare, the right to anything. The devolved governments have no say over that. They also have to work in solidarity with each other, which means that you will move with the majority opinion or with the establishment opinion, or you will be punished. Well, how will they be punished? Um, I don't know. There is the uh, new. The, just need to go to the yeah, they, sorry. Here's the, the here's the solidarity clause again, given uh, given effect to the principle of mutual solidarity, seeking to maximize the benefits, blah blah. But the next point here is new legally based uh, institutions of cooperation, a new statutory mandated council of nations and regions. When that's not the assembly of uh. nations and regions, this is the council of nations and regions to promote cooperation and facilitate joint working between different levels of government in the UK as a whole and within England with its role enhanced by the creation of an independent secretariat. Well, what is the independent secretariat? Uh, well, if we go back to the previous section you were looking at, the uh, dispute resolution. Yes. I believe it mentions that in there as a second or third point. I found the summation of it in there actually quite uh, precise and it's got most of the points I think Related to this here. one, no, it was the. It's the only three mentions of it. Oh no, the dispute resolution thing mentions roughly the same thing though. Uh, there should well, that, that's this bit here. Um, there should be a statutory body explicitly linked to the requirement for cooperation, solidarity clause, which is an independent secretariat, which has the power to call meetings and set agendas. It would not be wholly a new body, but an upgraded version of the Joint Ministerial Committee, uh, and therefore draw up existing staffing and resources. But basically. This independent secretariat they're talking about, uh, the independent secretariat will be able to take a more active role and where it's possible to seek to mediate, not arbitrate between the administrations to assist them um, to reach mutually acceptable agreements. So this, this is, this is, we're back in the resolving disputes section here. Hmm. I'm sorry, this is really confusing, but it is deliberately confusing. And we will go over the structure simplified in the diagram, because it is just, again, this is deliberately confusing. At the moment, the final stage in dispute resolution is for an unresolved dispute to be registered at the Joint Ministerial Committee, which cannot impose a, a solution on any government, nor should the Council of Regional Nations. But any dispute which remains unresolved after the discussion in this process should, if the relevant governments wish it, to be formally registered as, as an issue of concern. This feels like parody. This mm. is like parody bureaucracy. Um, in the second chamber of parliament, which should be legally obligated to consider the issue, taking evidence and episode and debate it. Again, not legally binding, blah, 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 blah. So what they're talking about here is that if you look at this new structure, and we'll get to the lower, uh, the lower bits of it uh, later on, if you look at this structure here, where you see the counts of the UK, um, that is superseded by the counts of, re uh, of nations of, and regions, which is what we're talking about which is effectively overseen by the replacement for the Lords, the Assembly of Nations and Regions. So not only does the Assembly of Nations and Regions have power over what is the British Constitution, it has power over dispute resolution between all different parts of devolved government. So it has power over... Through its yeah. independent intergovernmental secretariat. Yes. And if you look at this, the yeah. judgments made through different compliance and corruption boards. So basically, the Assembly of Regions and Nations, as strengthened by the Supreme Court and the Independent Secretariat, which are not, which will not be elected bodies, they will be appointed bodies, and they will have large primacy over what is this new power structure in the UK. As you can see here, the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish Assemblies become part of what's called the Council of the UK. 
we'll go into some of this again later, what the detail is here, which then goes into the Council of Regions and Nations, which is then overseen by the Assembly of Regions and Nations. There's input from Parliament here. So you can see that the devolved assemblies are actually being brought to heel by this structure. They are being folded into a greater and greater hmm. and greater layer each time you uh, go it's up. It's like there has, they have added three or four levels of federalization so that they can secretly centralize everything above that. Yes, that's what this is about. And you begin to see it as the document goes on. It's, again, I've had to draw this up by jumping around the document quite a lot. Um, to go into some of the stealth devolution here, what I call um, the Council of Regions and Nations, Governments of England, um, they talk about the creation of what is the Council of England, which uh, I can't spell, but... And the Council of England may be Westminster as we know it now. It may not. We're not no. entirely sure. Um, we believe that the Council of England, a forum for coordination cooperation. It, I'll just it's not actually explained very well here, but the Council of England to bring together uh, English local government and metro mayors with central government. So the Council of England is made up of all of these new metro mayors, all of these new metro kind of like London has assemblies and local councils roof. and also possibly possibly unions. unions. They mentioned they mentioned unions in one of the parts about. Uh, but England in particular, perform, blah, blah, blah. We meant that to produce Parliament. Um, so here's a bit more explanation of how this structure works. So you have the Council of England, which is a new body which will bring together local government and mayors. You have the Council of the UK, which is to manage relations between the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish and UK governments. Notice there's no mention of the English government there. Yeah. East of which is responsible for its own legislature. What I think, and my theory is... That the Council of England is meant to be the prototype form of the devolved English Assembly. Yeah. And that it will derive legitimacy from being made up of mayors and councils. So the, but it will effectively function in this Council of the UK alongside Holyrood, alongside the Welsh Assembly, and alongside well, Stormont. You can sort of look at it as they are they are like sidestepping the issue of English supremacy through the vehicle of Westminster by turning the UK into this own fabricated legal fiction yes. that serves as an abstract political body, not as you know an imperial identity naturally grown out of the conjoining of yeah. three, four nations. So you, you have... So if, if you're trying to vote on local matters, you, if, if you're trying to get a local matter solved, your local, you'll go to your local councillor, do 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 do, miss local councillor, miss local mayor, and we resolve this. And he'll go, uh, I'm not sure if that's constitutionally protected or not. And they'll go, Council of England, is that constitutionally protected or not? Council of England will go, I'm not sure. Council of England, Council of the UK, is that constitutionally protected? Then they'll go to the Council of Regions and Nations, and they'll go, um. We don't, we don't know, we don't agree. Uh, Assembly of the Nations and Regions, is that constitutionally protected? And they'll go, Supreme Court, is that constitutionally protected? <sighs> Secretariat, can we enforce this? Uh. And then they'll go, yes, that is constitutionally protected. And then the councillor or the mayor will go to you, sorry, we can't do anything about that. That's constitutionally protected. We can't change that area of law. And that, that will be the entirety of like, local government under this system. Yep. You will attempt to solve a problem and you will find that there are layers of primacy above what any local official can do so that they are paralyzed in solving any problem which is related to the lives of British people. Yep. They are wholly subservient to the step above them here. Well, it's the, the conversation we sort of had yesterday. The, the corollary of this is that it completely changes up the way in which bills and new laws are introduced into Parliament. Yes. No longer do you vote for a local MP who you can give a document of which he can take to the Speaker in the House yeah, yeah. during Parliament and say, well, this session we're proposing this, or this session we're proposing this amendment to this pre It's not law. mentioned in here, but I believe that all of these new bodies will have the power to scrutinise certain pieces of legislation, and they will replace, either in part or in whole, the ministerial committees that are made up of MPs. Mm. That seems to be an implied function here. 
It's not an explicit function, but it's an implied function. Okay, so for England in particular, it should also prove by the forum in which best practice is shared as devolution, as devolution continues to develop, as well as form uh, a formal mechanism for engagement with UK ministers. I'll just switch back to the document quickly. That's this section here. So they're basically saying devolution for England is developing. This isn't the last step. This isn't even the middle step. This is an in-between step. Right, so we should preemptively take over Cornwall and restart yeah. the tin mines. We recommend the Secretariat, this is the Independent, should produce and present to Parliament for consideration by the new Second Chamber in particular, an annual report and statement on the extent to which the Solidarity Clause has been fulfilled and on the work of the Council of Nations and Regions and it should have the power to make ad hoc reports if it's seen fit. So it's basically like the Stasi that oversees this whole entire yep. process. <clears throat> so to go back to our, sorry, I'll, I'll get our document there. Got some notes in it. Um, all of this functions as stealth devolution of an English assemb uh, assembly, um, the creation of new mayors and new democracy, um, the levels and roles in terms of who votes for what and who oversees what is, is deliberately confusing. The solidarity clause will mean that all of this will have to move together. And the legal obligation of cooperation and the constitutional obligation in terms of following all these new laws and these new rights will mean that there isn't anything going on um, in terms of localization at all. Um, it's pure power. It's full spectrum benefits, as I put it. And it, it all interacts together. You have to hunt around the document. But the new rights and protections interact massively with the Assembly of Regions and Nations and the power of the Constitution. It basically, for anyone who remembers our brief discussion of democratic centralism, it, it's very, very similar to Soviet democracy. Yes. If you look at what's going on here, and you have your tiny little councils, your little troikas down there, and they go up through the councils to the Assembly of Regions and Nations, which is effectively the supreme Soviet. It acts like a Soviet in that it is technically derived from all of the bodies beneath it, from the smallest local council, right up through all of this, from bits of parliament, they, they are the assembly of the will of the nation. But really, through the Solidarity Clause, and through the constitutional primacy of the Assembly of Regions of Nations, and through the constitutional subservience of um, all the devolved bodies beneath them, Effectively, there is a layer of politics which is settled politics. Yeah. There are areas of British life and areas of British policy that you will that will be set in stone as constitutionally protected and you will not be able to touch. And any government that inherits this structure and wishes to alter it will find the process nigh on impossible. Mm. Almost it, as if by deliberate. Yeah, if you thought on picking the bits of EU institutions that have be that became embedded in Britain is difficult. Imagine trying to unpick this mess. And also it serves really as a justification base for itself in that greater democracy equals more good in the eyes of this system. Well if you're if you're doing more voting, you're obviously more empowered. Yes. I mean that that couldn't not be true. Well there's also another aspect to this. We need to go over it relatively quickly. Um, the other aspect to this is the creation of an ethics commission. And also a powerful new body to ensure all appointments in public life are made on merit. Merit. But these two here are mentioned very briefly. They're not really mentioned in full. Um, they, they talk about um, standards of public life. They talk about... I mean, maybe one thing worth mentioning here that yeah. one of your big portions of your integrity and ethics commission will yeah. be judging things like whether or not net zero targets have been met yes or whether or not the uh, different different devolved bodies are meeting their you know standards and priorities and strength, and, yeah uh, the thing i is, mean i think they even state in here that as we will go on to show next week that it's a great benefit that manchester and the mayor of Manchester, Andy Barnum, has pushed the uh, net zero goal not to, to not from twenty fifty, but to uh, twenty thirty eight or something. Yeah, yeah, he's brought it forward. And that this is this is touted as a a good aspect of what's being done, so that they are gonna push forward the system, so there's more of that. 
somewhat. And people ask him about whether it's a social credit system. Don't worry, lads. Peterson is in control. Yeah, Peter, Pete, Peterson's in control. So we've got the Independent Integrity and Ethics Commission here, which is another layer of independent bureaucracy. Which and have... obviously a, a new UK-wide yeah. anti-corruption commissioner. Yes. So you've got an ethics commissioner, an ethics commissioner. You've got this as unnamed powerful new body to ensure all the points of public life. And you've got um, a new a new UK-wide anti-corruption commissioner. And this will have uh, ju- uh, ju- juries of ordinary citizens to determine whether rules have been broken. So effectively, like, weird struggle sessions. It's, it's the red meat for the first two points as well. Yeah, it is. Eliminating foreign money from UK politics. Banning MPs from having a second job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It talks hmm. about... This is that's a bit of your uh, radical centralism, as we yes. might call it, coming in. High standards and public appointments. Basically, it means that you can't be an MP unless you are fully on board with all. Oh, you got to be paid up. Yeah, you have to. You cannot violate any of the tenets of the new narrative. You cannot violate any of the tenets of the new normal. You can't be against net zero. You can't be against the welfare state in any capacity because you will therefore be violating the new British constitution. You can't be against anything which will now be both enshrined in law and enshrined institutionally with these new bodies that have new power. I wanted to quickly also show some of the bodies that have primacy over elected bodies. Here in the UK, it's a bit of a mess. I put the creation date on them. But the Supreme Court, as we talked about, has a, an enhanced role in interacting with this assembly of regions and nations, but it also was just created whole cloth in the dog days of the Labour government of Gordon Brown in 2009. The UK Supreme Court has only existed since 2009. Uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which oversees the Human Rights Act, which they mentioned as basically being the most... And the Equalities Act. Yeah, yeah. And, the, um, and, well, 2010 now. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, the Equality Act and all of that... Those two pieces of law have great primacy over all of public life in Britain. And they are overseen by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has massive power. And there's also, as you were mentioning the other day when we were going through this, the Office for, the Office for Budget Responsibility and the Monetary Policy Committee, which were pretty much prime movers in ousting the trust government yes. under the auspices of fiscal irresponsibility. Uh, monetary policy in Britain is not made by elected officials. It's made by appointed officials interacting with elected officials in these two offices, the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. There's a Climate Change Committee, which has teeth as well. They recently defeated the government uh, in violating its own uh, net zero plans of the and climate yes, change. Yes, we right? covered that a number yes. of weeks ago through the High Court, where they said that it wasn't that the government wasn't uh, or was putting forward a bill that isn't going to work. It's just that they didn't go to the lengths of writing in enough bullshit to tell us how it was going to work. <laughs> Um, so the three proposed bodies we've had, we've got are this as yet unnamed merit body, which will have primacy over all appointments in government. We have the independent intergovernmental secretariat, which will be the enforcement arm of the solidarity. Clause. I would imagine your anti-corruption commissioner is yeah. folded into that, possibly. And the independent integrity and ethics commission with your anti-corruption commissioner, which will basically oversee the conduct of all MPs to make sure that they are operating within the system. And it is it is a large enhancement both of elected bodies and of the bodies that sit essentially above elected bodies in the UK. But as you can see here, the sheer amount of democracy, they even acknowledge it in the document, I'm not going to go to the bit, but they, they say, well, we're not quite sure how these election cycles will work because we already have local elections. We already have parliamentary elections. There's already elections in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland for their regional assemblies. So are we just going to have an... Ex- are there going to be four elections a year in Scotland? Well, it's going to be the same here. Yeah. Because you're going to vote for your mayor. You're going to vote for your local council people. Yeah. You might vote for the leader of your trade union if you're part of one of those. Yeah. Then you'll vote for your representative in the county, say, of England. Yeah. Then you might also vote for another representative in the council of the UK. You might then also vote for no, another... No, no. Those are all derived bodies. They don't, you don't actually vote for those. But well, who's representing you in them? Is it all the same person that we threw? That or? is not answered in this document. <laughs> in fact, I imagine that these... What will happen is you'll have appointments from the lower bodies. So the leader of like the council will go to the Council of England and the Council of the UK will be made up of 
people appointed by. Mm. So a lot of these will probably be either appointments or representatives from from larger pools of representatives. Again, as big as this document is, this is 155 pages. That's these not mentioned. Questions are not answered within it. No. These, in fact, this structure is not something that's included explicitly. We had to infer this by reading the entire document. This, in fact, could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. This is this is my interpretation of how it will work. It's the most, I think, cohesive interpretation I've seen of this document. But the actual structure. Maybe different. It's very hard to tell what they're really trying to do here. And again, that is on purpose. I don't think we've missed anything here because there's quite a few, but there's some few other points we, we, we might want to cover. Is there anything you think that we've missed? I think we've got enough for the overview. I think trying to go through the specifics of this is kind of missing the wood for the trees. Yeah. Because... The way we're looking at it is not so much, oh, how are they going to implement more Gibbs? How are they going to yeah. bring more immigrants in? Because we know that's the default now. Yeah. You know, there's no point almost going looking for that. That's why we've, you know, here's what they've not mentioned. Here's what they haven't demonstrated in full. And yeah. here is the scope from which we should infer as to what their future actions may be. Because that's where, as you like to say so often, where the sausage is made. That is it's where, made yeah. in the arbitrary and the decisionist sort of uh, avenues of power. Well, to, to sum up, what this document, if put into practice, will do is create an unworkable system of distributed bureaucracy and continuous democratic growth of institutions. Democratic, I mean that in, in the bad way. Yes, um, well, to, I'm sorry, there's no good way to say yeah, democratic. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, a, to a point by which the ruling party and the ruling class of Britain really together, knitted together, will have massive primacy over all areas of British life. And instead of being more localistic, it means that your local council can have someone from the very top reach down to it directly mm. in a... a with constitutional enforcement behind it and go, what you are doing violates the spirit of this new Labour drafted British constitution. Yes. Stop it. You can't have... That's un-British yeah. of you. You can't stop the migrant centre in your area being opened because that's unconstitutional. That, 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 is, that is the... I don't think a lot of people have grasped what this would do. Yeah. It would be the greatest transfer of power, as they said, but the, uh, the opposite direction of what they talk about. As is always the case with uh, democratic thinking, it's an inversion. The more democracy you have, the more paralyzed the system is. The more paralyzed the system is, the greater role of the exception. The greater role of the exception, the more powerful the sovereign. And dispute resolution in a, a, with a thousand bickering voices is sovereign power. Yeah. Because there will only be dispute and conflict because well, it, of this. It, that's the thing. It's, it's not the content of the decision. It is the fact that a decision, decision is, is being, made yes. and must be made is the, the essence of the whole thing. It is. It's, it's pure managerialism. And there's all these councils and effectively troikas and assemblies. Full and... spectrum bio-Leninist dominance. Yes. I, I again... For those of you confused, I don't, I don't know. Do, do you think, do you guys think that the, <laughs> I'll take that off for a second, that this makes sense? Does this chart make sense to you guys in any way? I, actually, what I will do is, I won't get the chat because our chat thing currently isn't working, unfortunately. Uh, but I will ask you guys very quickly, do any of you guys have any questions? Uh, like, I know this is quite confusing. Um, yeah, it sounds to me like you're describing a narco tyranny. In fact, I was going to talk about that in the yes. outro, but you've actually... You've actually done a uh, a bit of a, a lead-in for me. Yes, this is the ultimate kind of application of a narco tyranny, in that there will be laws and there will be functionaries and there will be councils, and all of this will not function. But it will mean that at any point in any institution in Britain, they can invoke the solidarity clause and they can say, you are not in solidarity, comrade, with the rest of us. You are breaching your legal requirement to be in solidarity with the other bodies of the UK. And you will cease what you are doing immediately. Well, see, I wonder as well, and this is a, this is a whole other discussion, because of the way they're framing a lot of this, 
would the would the breaching some of these clauses not just carry you know political reprimands, but possibly legal and judicial reprimands? But say, for example, you as a mayor trying to go rogue and yeah. and banning or uh, vetoing the construction of an asylum center as a human rights violation that actually justifies some form of criminal punishment. <laughs> he is, you know what? Uh, I can never read your name, Sperka or whatever you say. It's almost like, uh, why do the Assembly of Nations and Regions seem to be trapped in an infinite loop with the Council of Re- Nations and Regions and the UK Parliament for that matter? That is deliberate. <laughs> As you can see here, there is all this cycling where nobody actually makes a sovereign decision. No. What's meant to happen and what we try to show you when it came to the answer is in this slide here, which is above these elected bodies will be the independent uh, intergovernmental secretariat. And they ultimately, along with the Supreme Court and with the help of the new body of the Assembly of, of Regions and Nations, it will empower it that way, will, will smash this loop. We'll stop the democratic well, yeah, as feedback. It, as we when we discussed it yesterday, the secretariat is a function of the Assembly of Nations and Regions yeah. supremacy over the Council of Nations and Regions. What this is meant to do is, in any instance where the uh, basically the elite institutions of Britain do not want something to enter into British law, it can continuously loop through all of this. Yeah, it is a rat's maze that leads nowhere which I think is a great, great demonstration of kind of the naive interpretation of how a democratic system works. Mm. All of this, the levers of power lead nowhere. Yeah. Uh, all of this... And, and before in about 10 years' time, that people unironically start using this as a graphic to teach kids in school and they say it makes yes. sense. <laughs> but you have correctly identified the loop. There is a feedback loop here between the Council of Reigns and Nations, which is a derived body, the Assembly of Regions and Nations, which is a secondary uh, elected body, and the UK Parliament, which is which an elected body. Which may or body. may not become the Council of England. We don't yeah, know yet. We don't know yet. And there will be, if there is disagreement between these three bodies, there will be cons- there will be a feedback loop of unresolution. And as we talked about during the dispute resolution session, ultimately, dispute resolution uh, stands with the, the Assembly of Regions and Nations. But really, that will be decided upon... In a, in, in, in a conscious level. pilot, I wash my hands sense yeah. by the Supreme Court. So really, when all of this... Yeah, but that'll be independent yeah. and intergovernmental, yes. don't you know? Yeah, there'll be councils, there'll be laws. Basically, what it means is that whoever holds power in Britain, ultimately, are the ones who make the decision, make the exceptions, break the deadlocks, which makes whoever is in power exceptionally powerful. It exponentially increases the power that they have. And that really is how all this is meant to function. It's, it's paralysis through bureaucracy. And yeah, council equals Soviet. Yes. If you think about these as Soviets, and if you think about the, the, the Assembly of Regions and Nations as, the, as like the, the ultimate Soviet at the top, there is a democratic centralist uh, aspect here in which the UK constitution has settled law, settled policy, settled rights, which cannot be questioned. And all of this will not be able to touch that because if the UK Parliament goes, we want to lower housing benefit, uh, the, the Assembly of Regions and Nations goes, you can't do that. That affects the UK Constitution. <laughs> and they go, we can do that. We're Parliament. We have parliamentary supremacy. And they'll go, well, we'll send it to the, let's see what the Supreme Court says. And the Supreme, Supreme Court will say, the Assembly of Regions and Nations has the power to veto anything that covers the UK's Constitution. And then you'll end up in a feedback loop. <laughs> Which will mean that ultimately, where Parliament, where the Assembly, and where the Court agrees, where the establishment agrees with itself, where sovereign power is executed, and where the agenda of the elite lines up, that is the direction that policy will always move in. Yeah. Oh, dear. I've made myself rather thirsty there. As as an epilogue, though, um, I want to talk briefly about where this document is derived from, which is a 1997 book by Tony Blair called New Britain, My Vision for a Young Country. It's funny as well, because when we first looked this up last week, we were like, oh, we should grab a copy of that book. It's only three quid. And then we went back to like a couple of days ago and it was like 25 pounds and all the cheap copies have been nabbed. All all of them have been nabbed. Uh, As campaign manifestos go, this is certainly an illuminating one. 
collection of speeches and articles that affords a good view of new labor that Blair has, has shaped and of the new Britain it will now try to create as prime minister. His vision is far less vapid than his prudent and rhetorically hollow campaign made one fear. <laughs> what emerges is indeed something new for the Labour Party, a vision of class cooperation instead of class struggle, an emphasis on efficiency and technological process, progress, at least as strong as the more traditional emphasis on social justice, a genuine informed concern for education, a, re <laughs> a recognition of the need for a market economy, but not for the demise of public means of intervention, a far more positive attitude towards Europe than in the past, and a devolution of power to Britain's components, putting an end to the era of big centralised government. It's bloody yeah. uh, Clintonology. It is. Clintonomics. The notion of a stakeholder economy and politics and emphasising investment, quality and trust was, if not a triumph of substance of a slogans, a good way of stealing conservative well, assets. Maybe that's a way to think about this as well, is that all these different entities... Oh, sorry, I've not got this up. Here we the, go. The councils, the assemblies... Yes. These are all stakeholders. They all hold a stake in the Council of the UK or the Council of the Assembly of Nations and Regions. Yes, they do. And it, it, it sort of goes maybe some way to suggest how this whole public-private partnership stuff will work, is that Really, it's just a way to obfuscate power once again and reorientate and recirculate elites so that there is a more consolidated, stronger elite class. Again, if you look in this book, there's, they're a bit more qualitative than quantitative in Blair's book. He's not like a complete autist like Brown, like Brown mm. is. But there are 32 mentions in this book of the, the word devolution. Um, I was interested because there is a mention of immigration in here. There's only one, but it's, in, it's within the talk of, of Europe. And he talks about the fact that we will maintain a veto. Um, where is that? Yeah. We will maintain a, a veto vigorously in areas such as security and immigration, which didn't happen. <laughs> it's, uh, Britain very famously had to accept all of, those, uh, all of those Romanians and Bulgarians. We did not maintain a veto of immigration at all. Within uh. um, kind of funny that he also talks about... I don't want to get it up. He also talks about a Labour Party going from an anti-Europe party to a pro-Europe party in such a a uh, a short space of time. God, spill. There it is, Europe. One hundred and seventeen mentions. Yes, there's one hundred and seventeen mentions of the word Europe in here. In fact, a lot of you may not know this if you weren't alive at the time, but. Britain had a much different role in the EU pre-Blair than post-Blair. Yes. In fact, Blair was one of the driving forces of the Euro well, project. The, well, what he did was essentially, without giving people way too much stuff yeah. to go home and think about, he took things like Europe's own human rights char yeah. and implemented in the UK under the guise of the Equalities Act, under the guise of the... Ethics and Human Rights Commission yeah. Committee. I just I managed to kind of borrow a copy of this from the online library. He, he it, basically yeah. implemented European legislation in Britain so that in future, if anyone tried to tear it apart, they could be like, "Well, no, this is what keeps us tied close to Europe is having yes. the same is having a what I think there would be a phrase for it, but you know, compatible or integratable legislation so that." European law and British law, in theory, looks like one to one when you try to compare them to each other. Well, within the context of the current conversation, let's say, because this this new Britain was actually quite underwhelming. It's just an extended Tony Blair manifesto. It, it's only important because the commission is named after it, mm. which really nods the kind of uh, nods the head and tips the cap towards this being a fully, fully kind of new Labour project. This is through and through like new labor attempting to uh to solidify their like their final victory in terms of its its imprint on the UK but it it seems bizarre to have an 155 page constitutional reform document at a time when the headlines are about pensioners freezing to death because they feel they can't afford to feed their homes what well, at a time of crisis like yes. this is is imperative that people make uh, sweeping and impactful moves. 
Well, I think we're kind of at the outro phase here because yeah. I don't I, I don't want to overload people with any more information. Um, if you have any questions, again, we're available on Telegram. I'm on Twitter somehow again, although that may not be permanent. Not you, it's your, uh, it's your assistant. Please. I was going to say, yes, I'm on via my unpaid media intern. Um, who is still very, very, very much unpaid. <laughs> um, uh, again, you can you can find us on Substack. You, we will also be, I should chill it properly, on Millennial. We will year. indeed. I, I will put out a community post about that. Um, you, you can go over to Millennial World's Odyssey channel, and it, I think it is live this evening, but we will be on, on the 21st, I believe, of, of December. We will indeed. So look out for us on Millennial. Um, next week's stream we've already kind of drawn up and will be hopefully an attempt to show a worked example of this yes this structure basically already being in practice this structure in an unofficial way already exists uh, the conservative party have done an extremely good job of laying the groundwork for what is going to become this new britain New Britain. I'm, I'm too tired to do my bit now. Uh, <laughs> but they, they have successfully laid the ground for what will be New Britain. And our stream next week will be on demobilization, on the efforts to demobilize large parts of the British economy and the British public to create these small climate lockdown zones. And there's been a lot of conspiratorial headlines about it, a lot of kind of national inquirer level reporting but it's actually worse than most people say yeah it, it is it's yeah if only you knew how bad things really are we'll go over it in a serious manner we're not going to go over it in a hyperbolic manner because the the, the facts speak for themselves mm. the policy speaks for itself and it is uh the, the case we're going over is relatively nightmarish because it includes many of the things that we were promised would never happen and they are they essentially have already happened so uh look forward to that one but it will show you how power on a local level... Well, I'll actually use this document again because there's a bit in here I didn't go over I want to save for yeah. next week, which is a, a hierarchy of trust, which is just really funny. <clears throat> they, they basically just go out and say that they use the cloak of local government to hide the fist of national government. Um, but yeah, our demobilization stream should be a, a relatively in-depth one because we've done a lot of research on this. Uh, it's one of the areas I've been working on for... Um, six months maybe worth of information uh, because of the, the, the Great Manchester Zone stuff as well? Uh, I, yes and no. I suppose it's something we've kept an eye on yeah, and yeah. throwing bits and pieces at. So There'll be, there'll be more of these though. Anyway, enough rambling. Yeah. I believe that's a, a good night from us. Yes, that's, that's a good night from me. So, good night guys. And uh, I'll just double check I have not donations. I have not. So, good night. See ya. Cool.